JM on Cars is sponsored by Car Vertical. With just a registration number, or even better, a VIN, Car Vertical will search over 20 European databases to find out whether any car you're looking at has a hidden past. They can see if a vehicle was used as a taxi, stolen, suffered fire damage, or involved in a crash, even when it wasn't written off, so could pass other checks. Car Vertical is now an essential tool in my car buying kit, putting all the information I need to know together in one easy to read report. Even better, if you follow the link in the description down below, you'll get 10% off. A big thank you to them for being today's sponsor. Hello everybody, today I am driving the current G20 generation BMW M340i X-Drive. And besides being a mouthful to pronounce, getting one of these cars for review was actually a lot harder than it probably should have been. You see, each of us car YouTubers has manufacturers that we work with and others that we don't, and the reasons for which we do and don't sometimes aren't very obvious. Sometimes they are. For example, it's no surprise that if I ask McLaren for a press car, they're probably not going to respond. However, I have had more BMWs than any other car brand in my history. In fact, at one point in time, one third of all of the cars I'd ever owned were Beamers. Something like nine out of my 30 cars had come from BMW. Yet, if ever I email them, I don't even get a response. That's a shame, really, because actually there's quite a few cars in the lineup that I'd really like to try. Why is it that they don't even talk to me? I couldn't say. Maybe they just really don't get my emails, but I've actually spoken to them in person and they've been lovely, and then when I go to email them, nothing. So this car is not a BMW press car. It has come from Dick Lovett Swindon. Not Dick Lovett BMW, Dick Lovett Ferrari. My 430 is currently in, having a quick bit of remedial work done, and I explicitly requested this as my courtesy car, because my buddy James had got it a few weeks earlier when there were some problems with his FF, and I actually really quite liked this. Now there are plenty of things to not like about the M340i X-Drive, aside from the silly name. I don't like the fact this is now the only way, barring an M3, to get yourself a six-cylinder petrol 3 Series. I don't really like the M340i badging at all for a number of reasons, and we'll get onto those in a little bit. I really don't like the sort of over-the-top styling at the front, which now has several large events that aren't real vents at all. If you're gonna put big events on a car, they should do something. In fact, even most of the traditional kidney grill is actually closed most of the time for better aerodynamics. And this makes it even more confusing as to why BMW went with that gopping styling for the new M3 and the 4 Series. Note that I say just the M3 there because, as you can probably tell, the regular 3 Series did not get said same controversial styling. Compared with the 3 Series of yore, those were quite a handsome thing. This seems very try-hard, and I'm not sure it's going to age all that well. I also don't like this interior screen setup. This one over here is okay, and you can still manipulate it with the iDrive rotary controller down here, or you can use it as a touchscreen. So that's about as good as you can expect from a modern car. So that's all right. However, it's this central display here that I'm really not fond of because it commits that cardinal sin. It doesn't really do anything you couldn't do with the old setup of two analog gauges and a screen in the middle because you've got your basic trip computer or general information over here on the right, and that's kind of all you can do. And then in the middle, your choices really are map or nothing. That's about it, and that's a real shame. I'm also not impressed with the fact that this car, over the last two and a half thousand miles, has averaged 29.6 to the gallon. Or to put it another way, precisely 0.1 of an MPG less than my old E46 330Ci Club Sport. Granted, this has nearly another 150 horsepower on top of that car, 230 in the old one, and 374 here, thanks in very, very small part to a mild hybrid system. But you'd hope that that mild hybrid system would have at least improved the MPG figure just a little bit. Apparently not. I'm sure on a run, relatively good economy is achievable. The B58 has always been very good at that. However, if you're going to be pressing on, it's really not that good. 
I'm sure in terms of the planet and CO2 and all that stuff, it's probably much better than the old E46. But in terms of what it drags out of your wallet, no improvement at all. That's a shame. From in here too, there's no real way of telling, barring the little logo on the dash here, that this is an M340i. It's just a nice 3 Series really, and it is generally pretty nice. I'd say BMW have got the balance more or less right. Yes, not all of this is leather, but this is still a 3 Series. The M3 now, you can spec it to about 90,000 quid, and when you've done that, things like this wouldn't be so acceptable. This obviously is a little bit lesser of a car in the first place, and as a 3 Series, I think this is a fairly nice interior. You've got this black fabric headliner, which I kind of like, always have. The choice of light colour leather actually lifts the interior Area too makes it feel a little bit more upmarket. You've even got this nice stitched airbag here, and it actually does feel like a fairly quality place, which it ruddy should for a list price of about 60,000 quid. Like the X3 that I drove not too long ago, there are also some absolutely baffling choices here in terms of specification. For example, this car has double glazing on the front. It has the little BMW M tricolor on all of the seat belts, yet it has manual seats. Don't quite get that at all. There are lots and lots of angles in here to the extent that you'd swear they pinched a designer from Lamborghini, but it's a fairly nice car to do some miles in, and that's one of the reasons that I requested it. It's also ruddy quick. <laughs> Like most B58 powered cars, there's no particular reward for revving it out. The incredible torque has no issues with just dragging you down the road at quite an amazing pace, really. Just shy of 370 pound foot, which works out at bang on 500 newton meters here. And what I'm really impressed with is the weight figure, too. Okay, 1650 kilos is not exactly a lightweight car. But when you look at the fact it's got all-wheel drive, it's got the mild hybrid tech, it's got turbos, and it has to meet all of the current noise and emissions regs, I was expecting this to be a sort of 1.7 or 1.8 tonne car. And actually, it's not, so good on BMW for that. Unfortunately, they are still using McPherson struts up front, but they've got a multi-link at the back now, so I guess that's something of an improvement over the old cars, which were McPherson strut all round. And what on earth is going on here today? I've chosen a slightly different test route to normal, and it's completely and totally filled with work traffic. Oh, what the heck? In terms of ride comfort, it's perhaps a little bit bouncier and harsher than I would expect, but really only, only just a little bit. It's still actually a reasonably comfortable thing and very nice to do miles in. This does have adaptive dampers and you've got a selection of different driving modes down here. One of the buttons I have yet to find, and perhaps doesn't exist, is the one to disable auto start-stop. If you put the engine into its sporty mode, it will turn itself off, or so it seems. However, when you're in comfort, which I have been for much of the time, it will turn itself off quite a lot. And that includes when you're sort of coasting up to a junction, and this means that if you then go to put your foot down and pull away, it can be a little bit jerky as it then sort of turns the engine back on and reapplies the power that you've asked for. This is also about the easiest car to speed in I have ever driven. Generally speaking, I don't really speed that much. I do rather need my license for the job that I do. However, with this, I think because it's so, so quiet and also geared very, very high, you suddenly find yourself doing sort of 85 on the motorway, 40 through a village, and I generally really do not do that. But it's a, a quite a hazard with this. I'm very glad that you've got the heads-up display because otherwise you, you simply have no concept, really, of the speeds that you are doing. And that could get you in a little bit of trouble. One piece of technology that BMW still seem to not be able to get right is the speed limit warning. I'd say it's incorrect about half the time that I've driven this car, which is very frustrating because it will then flash up to try and tell you off for speeding, and actually half the time you're not speeding, it just thinks you're still in a 30 or a 40 or a 50 or, or something. Considering in a few years we're supposed to be having mandatory speed limiters in our car, that seems like something manufacturers should be getting right by now.
let's bring it into sport mode now. And in sport, you can have it set a few different ways. You can have it configured to your own preferences, which I've got. So that's basically everything sporty except suspension, or you can have it set to its own sport or sport plus mode. And there's different things. You've got adaptive, eco pro, all sorts. But um, let's put it into manual, put our foot down, give you a little sample of what she's like. The 8-speed ZF gearbox here responds really quite well. It doesn't have that bite of a DCT or even some of the other implementations of the ZF that I've experienced, like in the Alfa Giulia. However, for a car like this, it works really, really quite well. You see, here's the problem with a car like this. What is it actually meant to be? What is it trying to be? Because it, it can't be an M3 because that's the M3. So it's got to be a little bit less, but then it should be a bit more than the regular 3 Series because they've gone and stuck these M badges on it. And that's where I think they've made the mistake because by sticking M badges on it, you create a certain level of expectation. You tell people this is gonna be essentially a baby M3. And simply put, it's not. actually make a reasonably nice noise when you're pressing on that classic smooth BMW six cylinder but it's not exactly something to get out of bed for in the morning yeah, it's decent but not a great sound in truth even the current M3 doesn't actually sound that good so not really BMW's fault I think in some other markets you can actually get this in two-wheel drive but here it's X drive only or at least that's what the BMW configurator tells me and I have to say I actually quite like the X-Drive bit. With this amount of power, if you're gonna have this as a daily driver, which I think most people will, all-wheel drive will bring a lot of benefits. And once you get up to speed, the suspension all starts to work, and the steering actually does even start to develop a little bit of weighting. Now you can tell that with this steering, they've set it so that as you build the speed, the assistance does sort of bleed away. And one thing I really would like them to have done was just to let the assistance go away a little bit earlier. You see, I'm in the sporty steering setting, but even so, it's only when you get to about sort of 80 mile an hour or anything, the steering actually gets that interesting. And of course, by then, you're probably going a little bit too quick for roads like this. Whether it'll be any better with two wheel drive, I highly doubt it. BMW steering hasn't been that brilliant for a very, very long time. The heads-up display here is actually quite nice to have. It's definitely what I would consider an essential. Not sure whether it's actually standard with this or not, or you can get an upgrade heads-up display. Honestly, really don't know, don't care. One thing to note though, is the, the list price of something like this, I, I went on the configurator the other day, you're gonna be spending close to, or just over, about 60,000 quid, which is a lot. However, there are examples up for sale with next to no miles on, we're talking sort of 1500 miles or so, and they were about 45 grand. So you're already talking about 25% off list price for a car that's well, not really gone anywhere. And so we'll still have the balance of any service and warranty package, or at least enough of it. And at 45 grand, this suddenly becomes a very, very compelling purchase. When you consider that the Golf GTI I got in was about 42 grand, okay, granted, if you could get a bit of discount on that, it's probably gonna be a bit cheaper again. But the Golf at 42,000 quid, I sort of I did struggle to justify a little bit. However, with the BMW, I do feel like I'm getting somewhat more for my money. I actually did drive the new generation M3 not so long ago at a press event down at Goodwood. I really like that car. Now it's not like the M3s of old, it's grown up quite a bit. However, I think it kind of works now and controversial styling aside, it is a car I could actually see myself buying if it weren't for the fact that it's 90,000 quid. And that to me is, is just too much. Once things normalize, I suspect in about 18 months, just like all of the M3s and 4s before it, you're probably gonna be able to get some pretty crazy deals on one of those. I know I said that it doesn't really have that much interest in revving out, but it's not like it gives up either. In fact, it pulls pretty strong that six and a half, you know. 
brakes are decent too, certainly had no issues with them. Not over servo, respond nicely, got plenty of power, that's for sure. There's about the right amount of space in the back of this car. Again, considering it's a three series and not a five or a seven, boot space is actually pretty good too. Always a bit of a three series highlight, always had a bit more room than you'd expect in it. If you're thinking this is gonna be a sort of cut price M3, you will inevitably be disappointed. But then the current M3 probably doesn't really drive like you think it will anyway. And that's in many ways just a slightly harder, faster version of this. But for most day-to-day -day stuff, this is certainly the better car. So the M340i is unlikely to go down in the pantheon of great BMWs, but it's absolutely, certainly, a very, very good car. And if BMW PR are watching and you're feeling a little bit brave, I would love to have a go at the new M135i and see what that's really like. Because this and the new M3 have been a real pleasant surprise. Anyway, that's enough from me. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.